It's not very common for a highly successful franchise to have reached the highest of highs and also the lowest of lows, but when it comes to the Terminator franchise, this thing has seen it all. From Oscar-winning films to critical and financial bombs, there's little that this franchise hasn't done, for better or worse. Starting out as a pretty streamlined series, the current state of the Terminator universe is looking almost as bleak as Judgment Day itself. So where did this franchise go wrong? Do you think it even went wrong? And what does the future of this franchise, I'm talking about the literal future, like our future, not the many, many different futures that this series presents us with, hold in store? And in today's day and age, with the rise of AI technology, the Terminator franchise seems to be more relevant than ever. Could this be the path we're going down? Is Terminator just a glimpse into our own future, but just off by a few years? In today's video, I'm going to be going over each and every one of the six Terminator movies, breaking down the things you need to know, as well as my own review before I go into how all these movies sorta, kinda connect, and then the ones that just don't really make any sense at all. So grab some clothes after time traveling, or not, I don't really care, watch Arnold get progressively disinterested in this franchise, and try to keep track of the many different Sarah and John Connors as we travel through the multiverse that is Terminator. So the story of this movie is fairly simple. Kyle Reese is sent from the future to protect Sarah Connor from an evil machine called Arnold Schwartz, I mean, uh, the Terminator. Why is that? Because in the future, there's a war against machines and everything is post-apocalyptic. Sarah Connor is the mother of John Connor, the leader of the resistance. So a Terminator is sent back to kill her so that way John is never born. Kyle Reese is sent there to protect her, but he ultimately gets sidetracked by falling in love with her and sleeping with her. Talk about a bad employee sleeping with the boss's mother, but wait, he actually succeeds because Kyle Reese turns out to be John Connor's father. I'll take actions that will get you fired and literally any other job for 10,000, please. The beginning of this film is superb. It tells us who the good guy is and who the bad guy is with very little dialogue throughout the first act from both Kyle Reese and the Terminator. Even with Kyle doing some kind of bad things like stealing clothes, threatening a police officer, and a few other things, we ultimately know he's the good guy. This whole first act is a masterclass in show don't tell when it comes to the mission they're on. Obviously there's some exposition that comes later on, but that's needed for a film like this when they're telling such a complex story. There's a few different flashback sequences that are all really well done and the transitions between them are amazing. These flashback sequences show us this really cool looking war that's going on between the human resistance and the cybernetic terminators, but they also tell us a lot about who Kyle is and help develop his character. When Sarah's scenes get thrown into the mix, they contrast her normal life to the life of Kyle Reese from the future. It's super jarring in the best way because it really brings emphasis on Kyle's mission, whatever that might be because the audience doesn't really know it just yet. They just see the stakes of the future. In a lot of ways, this is a full-blown horror movie. The Terminator is a monster, and while it might not be the typical monster that makes you turn on all the lights in the house at night, that almost makes it even more scary. This literal killing machine is indistinguishable from a normal human. And like I said, are we just a few years away from all of this? What makes this even scarier is how grounded this movie is. For a story involving a cyborg and time travel, this seems like a very realistic story. Minus the, you know, lack of reloading in the action scenes, but that's in every action movie, but it makes up for it by having the most realistic depiction of what it's like working as a server. There are some very graphic scenes in this movie, far more than I remember because I haven't watched this movie in a few years, and I'm honestly surprised I was even allowed to watch this as a kid. But these scenes certainly add to the horrific tone of the movie. The dramatic irony when it comes to Sarah's situation makes the tension and suspense of the film age incredibly well. This is still a supremely made horror film, and while the effects might have aged a bit, the actual storytelling elements being told through cinematic language haven't aged at all. And and that's really a testament to James Cameron. Say what you want about the guy, he might have the biggest ego out of anybody in the history of the world, but there's also a reason that he has that ego.
ago. The selling point of the movie is Arnold as the Terminator. And Arnold really is the perfect Terminator. It's so easy to see why this franchise is so tied to his name because he is incredible in this role. He plays this cyborg attempting to blend in as a human so scarily accurate. Of course, his voice and body help with that, but he is genuinely terrifying in this film. Equally as fantastic is both Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor and Michael Bean as Kyle Reese. All three of these performances elevate this movie to the classic that it is, and without them, it might not be so well regarded. At the center of this story is the romance between Kyle and Sarah. You have all these different elements of the story, the Terminator, time travel, different storylines, characters, horror, action sequences, but it's all for nothing if the core of this movie doesn't work. And for the most part, it does work. It's a little quick, Sarah says that she only knew him for a couple of hours, and then he tells her that he's always loved her based on this one picture that John gave him along with some stories. But these were stressful times, you know? He was from the future where he had never been with a girl, so in that regard, you can kind of look past it a little bit. The ending of the film gives you some great answers. We see the photo that was taken that Kyle had in the future, and Sarah leaves John some tapes that he would listen to later on talking about his father. So you can assume that John actually did know that Kyle was his father and sent him there on purpose. I hadn't watched this movie in years, and I've been watching a lot of older films recently, and they're kind of hard to rate when I hadn't seen them either at all or in a long time, just because of how much cinema has changed over the years, but this film holds up incredibly well. And I think that this time watching it was the most enjoyable experience I've had watching it at all. 8.5 out of 10, starting out real strong here. As with any sequel, the story has to get bigger, the plot more complex, the characters more emotionally resonant, and Terminator 2 Judgment Day is no exception. While the story does everything that every sequel does, it does it better than almost every other sequel out there. The Terminator is more threatening and difficult to kill, the story has much more at stake, there's more characters, the visual effects and the budget for the film are greatly increased, and it does all of this close to perfection. Perfection. The opening scene sets up a great contrast between what life is like now and what it's going to be like in the future. So enjoy this video and YouTube in general while it lasts people because this is our future. The first act of this film is rushed, covering the same plot as the first film, but purposefully done. Though this time they're looking for the actual John Connor, not just Sarah. But when both of our time travelers get to their objective, the story flips on its head. Having Arnold's Terminator be the good guy this time around opens up so many different opportunities, and this film takes advantage of all of them. As an audience, we think that he's there to kill John, but that turns out not to be true, and we get to see Sarah's reaction to this, thinking that he's there to kill everybody again. My girlfriend watched this movie for the first time, and I got to see her reaction to this scene, and she thought that Arnold was gonna be the bad guy again, so this twist actually worked on her, and seeing her reaction to that proves how well crafted this whole first act was. Linda Hamilton is even better in this film, playing an entirely different version of Sarah Connor. She's darker, more mistrusting, but prepared and capable. This film really proves why Sarah Connor is one of the best female characters of all time, and it makes sense why they've tried to recapture this magic so many times, and that's all due to Linda Hamilton's portrayal. She really played the damsel in distress in the first film, but she's such an active character in this one, and it makes it seem like these are two completely different characters. While the first half of the film largely plays out the same as the first one, but with a twist, the second half of the film introduces something different when they get Sarah back, ultimately trying to stop the future, and this opens up a lot of different opportunities for character drama. Sarah wants to take matters into her own hands, John wants to stop her and forces the T-800 to do what he says, and the storyline is very refreshing after the first half of the film. They also achieve what they set out to accomplish and stop Judgment Day, yet there's still sequels, but more on that later. This movie is paced extremely well. It doesn't feel like one set piece to the next, you're very into the character moments, the decisions that they make, their relationships to each other, and the stakes of the story, which makes the action set pieces that much better. A lot of the action scenes are some of the most iconic in action movie history. Arnold with a lever action gun on a motorcycle, Robert Patrick's emotionless running, all of these are iconic and unique, like the T-800 being told not to kill anybody, but also having to create enough of a distraction for them to escape 
escape. It adds so many more layers to the scene because we're not just in awe by what's happening, but we don't want Arnold to kill anybody needlessly either. The plot is almost completely solid. It uses the characters' backstories and motivations to move the plot forward, like how Sarah is in the loony bin because there was no evidence of the Terminator, and this seemingly small plot point is what moves the plot along in the second half of the film. Just like Sarah Connor, Arnold as the Terminator is even better in this film. He plays a friendly Terminator just as menacing as he did the first time around, but also gives a pretty realistic portrayal that this Terminator is the same one with a few minor tweaks. Almost all of his lines in this movie are iconic. If you think of an iconic Arnold Terminator quote, odds are it's probably from this movie. The horror moments from the first film certainly take a back seat. There are a few moments, like when Sarah has a dream about Judgment Day, when Arnold reveals what he truly is to Miles Dyson, and probably the scariest scene is when the Terminator explains the events that led to Skynet taking over, because it sounds awfully familiar to the times that we're living in, so again, probably a few years away. Also, I didn't mention this during the first film, but the music is iconic and fantastic. It has all mostly aged really well, more so in this one than in the first one, but both soundtracks are great. But the real heart of this story is John and the Terminator. Seeing John teach the Terminator about the world and stuff that humans do is really great. The keys in the car shade, hasta la vista baby, and when Arnold sacrifices himself in the end, I was even getting a little teary-eyed. A lot has been said over the years about Edward Furlong's performance as John, but I think he did a good job. He was a kid actor, and this is one of those kid actors who got so much hate from the world that he never really recovered from it. Just like Jake Lloyd as Anakin Skywalker in Episode 1. It's really unfortunate that these things happen, because they certainly did a better job than literally anybody who was complaining about them, because these were all adults making fun of a child for acting. If you're not an actor yourself, then keep your opinions about a child trying to do a job to yourself. If you knew what you were saying on the internet would cause a literal child to turn away from doing something they loved and send them on a downward spiral for literally the rest of their life, you probably wouldn't say it, so just shut up up and let a kid try their best. Anyways, the ending of the film actually ends the story of the Terminator, especially the alternate ending, so it doesn't seem like there's much more to do with this world story-wise, but these films made a lot of money, so the show must go on. Above all else, this is the perfect blockbuster movie. There's comedic moments, there's moments of genuine shock and terror, suspenseful moments, great action scenes, a twist that makes this film stand out from its predecessor. Maybe it's not fun for the whole family, but it's fun for the adult members of the family. It's fantastic, might be one of my favorite films of all time. Nope, uh, no, it actually definitely is one of my favorite films of all time. 9.5 out of 10. So it took me until recently to realize this, but there are so many different trilogies out there that start off really strong, have an even better or on par with the first one sequel, and then don't quite stick the landing or cross the finish line. While a lot of third entries can be good films, they're not quite on par with the first two films in the trilogy, and Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines is no exception to that rule. The first act of this film is, again, similar to the first two movies. We get a new Terminator, but this time it's a girl. And instead of going after Sarah to prevent John's birth, or John himself, they're going after John's friends, which is kinda cool, I guess? This Terminator does absolutely change the future because she kills a ton of his friends, so I really wonder what the future turned out to be like after that, but that's never answered. In a lot of ways, this actually does work as a sequel to Terminator 2. There's some great callbacks, characters, plot points that make this feel like a cohesive story. Though sometimes this does stray a bit too far into the rehashing territory, so it is a bit of a double-edged sword. The overall story of this film is really just Terminator 2 again, but worse. The set pieces are all very similar, maybe they're on a grander scale, but a lot of these moments are done practically, like the car chase scene, so I'll give props where they are due and the action sequences are still really fun to watch. Arnold is the best part of the film, of course. He leans into more of the humorous aspects, but he also plays a different Terminator that he did in the last one while still playing the good guy. He's certainly the best written character in the film, and his performance stands out amongst the others. The 
absence of Sarah Connor is really majorly felt. Dying off screen to leukemia is not a very Sarah Connor move and honestly disrespectful to the character in general. Not that she dies to cancer, but that she dies off screen. They very well could have had a story about a dying Sarah Connor, so she does everything and anything that she can to get John to safety before the real Judgment Day happens. That would have been really great. They really should have done everything that they possibly could to get Linda Hamilton back. She was going to come back, but she didn't like the script that was given to her. Apparently, Sarah was going to die halfway through the film with a very unceremonious death, so she just passed on the role altogether. But the script could have used some retooling anyways, so why they didn't listen to their leading actress of the franchise is beyond me, but without Sarah Connor, this movie does have a certain emptiness to it. My favorite scene in this movie is when Arnold is explaining to John and Kate about the future that he came from and how he's here to obey Kate's orders this time around, not John's because he's the one who actually killed John in the future. He explains that he was chosen for the mission specifically because of his likeness to the Terminator that John had a boyhood connection with, and that Kate reprogrammed him in the future in order to be sent back. Whereas Kate in the present doesn't seem like the person who would know how to do any of this, and neither does John, but I'll get to that in a minute. There are a great deal of either inconsistencies or plot points that just don't really make a whole lot of sense. The explanation of timelines and how Kate and her father play into all of this doesn't make any sense at all. John says that if the last Terminator hadn't come back in time, then John would have resumed a relationship with Kate, met her father from there, and then that's how Skynet would have taken over, but that's not how Skynet took over in Terminator 2, so this scene is really strange and it just doesn't make any sense. There's also this one scene when the TX is going around killing John's friends and it finds a rag with John's blood. It has this like emotional response to knowing that it found John, but Terminators aren't supposed to have any emotions. You could argue that Arnold's Terminator isn't, and maybe since this one is more advanced it does, but I still think that's a stretch. I mean, just listen to this clip of Arnold explaining how Terminators are supposed to work. Because a Terminator can never ever look down at his hand what he's doing, because he's a machine. He's a robot. And as I said, when he walks, he has to have a certain walk. I mean, he scans and looks around. He has to have a certain scan. It has to be absolutely clear at all times that this is a machine yeah. with absolutely no human behavior. Arnold really understands the Terminator and how everything is supposed to be, so it's no wonder why he's the best part of this film and probably the franchise as a whole. Now, actually seeing Judgment Day for itself is pretty cool, and overall how it happens is really well done. I think it would actually make more sense for this one to be called Judgment Day since, you know, this is the one where Judgment Day actually happens, but whatever. The ending is really dark, but I actually think it makes the most sense, and I really like it. The good guys don't win, Judgment Day isn't prevented, and all along the Terminator's goal was to keep John safe. It's kind of a bummer of an ending, and I love every aspect of it. Now, for Nick Stahl's performance as John Connor, I think there's a lot to be desired. He does a fine job as an actor, but I just don't really see him as John Connor, and that's because I have a very specific bias. It would have been cool to see John kind of lean into his origins as a leader and a Terminator killing machine, but he doesn't. He still doesn't seem like mankind's greatest hope, he just kind of seems like a low-life loser. And since the end of this movie is where Judgment Day happens, it still doesn't seem like he's fit to lead an army of any kind, so how he turns from this to this is still a complete mystery and not even a very good one at that. It's the curse of the three. The new director comes in, they don't bring back principal actors, and the story suffers from it. They try to live too much in the past success of the franchise instead of trying new things. It's still a good movie, but nothing groundbreaking like the first two were. I'll give Terminator 3, Judgment Day, I mean, uh, Rise of the Machines, a 6.5 out of 10. So, just a very quick disclaimer here. I absolutely love this film. This was the one I grew up with and saw it as a kid in theaters, and there's not really such thing as a bad movie when you're a kid, so the nostalgia glasses are fully on with this one. I love this movie. I said that I have a really big bias when it comes to John Connor, and it's because of this film. 
Christian Bale is John Connor to me. It's the role that comes to mind when I first think of his name. Most people think Batman or Patrick Bateman, but for me, it's John Connor. When I picture Terminator or hear the word, this is the movie that I imagine. So many different people in the comments sections when I make videos like this say things like, well, this isn't a very unbiased video. No, of course not. This is my channel. I'm gonna say what I want. I love this movie. If you don't like this movie, deal with it. The idea of a Terminator film centering on the future timeline is something that every Terminator fan wanted. It was the natural progression of the story and where the franchise had to go. They've tried stopping Judgment Day from happening, it didn't work, so now let's see the future for ourselves. But after re-watching these films, something occurred to me. The future in this film isn't like the future that we've been seeing in the previous three films. There's no laser weapons that make everything light up vibrantly on screen. This movie is more or less pretty grounded using weapons from modern day, and there is almost zero vibrance to this film. Everything is just brown looking. But still, this is the future, let's get into it. This movie immediately sets up John to be the chosen one of the resistance when they land on the ground and they say, is on the ground. And this is something so small, but I really like it. But there is a strange thing. John isn't the actual leader of the resistance. He's more of like a sergeant. He's important, but he's not the leader. So I can't wait to see where this movie goes and see him become the leader, since of course he has to be the protagonist, right? Well, not really. John Connor does play a primary role, but for the large part of the second act, he doesn't do anything. He does get his moments to shine, by the end he really does seem like the leader of the resistance and everybody is listening to him over the other leaders, he listens to the tapes that Sarah left him, and this moment really brings the franchise full circle. This also does feel like a sequel despite all the different actors. Terry Crews even makes an appearance as a dead body, which was strange, but John and his wife from the previous film making an appearance, this feels like a sequel to Terminator 3. Would the same actors have helped this illusion that this is a sequel? Sure, but do I like these actors better? Absolutely. Speaking of illusions, this movie gives you the illusion that John Connor is the protagonist, but really it's Sam Worthington's Marcus Wright. Is Marcus a good character? Yes. Is he what we wanted to see in a film about John Connor saving and recruiting Kyle Reese into the resistance? Absolutely not. Marcus Wright is the primary protagonist of the film, and he does a great job. But he is the weak spot of the movie. It's nothing about him or his character, it's just that he doesn't really belong in this story. There's always a weak spot in every movie. It's usually apparent due to the actor or the writing of the story, but Marcus's story in this film is good. He's played very well. It's so rare that a weak spot in a film is performed and written really well, yet still the weak spot of the film. But that's Marcus Wright in this movie. His unknowing infiltration of the Resistance is a really strong storyline, but this movie is overshadowed by John Connor and Kyle Reese, both of whom aren't given enough screen time. Anton Yelchin was a great Kyle Reese. He channels Michael Bean's performance while also making it his own. For those that don't know, Anton Yelchin passed away in 2016 in a really unfortunate and tragic accident. He was a fantastic actor, and I'm sure if he were alive, he'd be an A-list actor right now. I hardly ever hear anybody talk about him anymore, and that's a real shame. Kyle Reese is responsible for a lot of the great callbacks to the original films. He says his iconic, come with me if you want to live, and Marcus channels Kyle by saying, what day is it, what year, just like Kyle said in the first Terminator film. And it does give some connective tissue to why Kyle says what he does when he travels back in time. Marcus Wright also teaches Kyle a few tricks that he uses down the road, and I always like seeing scenes like this during prequels, or I guess sequels in this case. Maybe the most infamous thing to come from this film is that video of Christian Bale freaking out on the cinematographer. Are you professional or not? Yes, I am. Do I walk around and rip that? No, shut the up, Bruce. Do I want? No! No! Don't shut me up! This movie was loaded with production issues, the director really wasn't up to the task that this movie presented itself with, and overall this movie had the wrong team behind the camera. Clearly. I was looking at the light. Oh, good for you! So like I said, this movie's future is very different from the future we've seen in previous films. But I actually like that this future is different. There's no laser guns or anything because that stuff hasn't been invented.
the terminators are all older t600s with the t800 that we know in the previous films being manufactured during the plot of this film i can totally imagine where this trilogy could have gone had it been a trilogy and truly i would have loved to see it go on there are seeds being planted for future installments the signal jammer is definitely a prototype for turning terminators on their side kyle and john meeting is a great start but nowhere near what it could be even marcus himself is the prototype of the terminators we're used to seeing but John and Marcus's relationship confuses me. John seems to be so confused that a Terminator would act human or have human feelings, but John is completely aware of this from when he was a kid and an adult. So why is he acting like this is some revelation or something that he's never seen before? He doesn't trust Marcus or anything he says, but why? And this isn't the time for a different timelines talk because in the beginning john is very clearly aware of what a t800 is and what it means for the future slash past so this is all the same timeline as the trilogy but john seems so quick to distrust marcus and make him the enemy and it doesn't fit with the character that we've seen in the past john says he doesn't trust marcus because he has skin on top of his skeleton but why John has been trusting Terminators with skin since he was a teenager. There's also this whole Marcus and Blair love story that's trying to be like Sarah and Kyle, but it doesn't really work here. And if you remember, I said it only kinda works in the first movie, so if it only kinda worked there, it definitely doesn't work here. This movie ultimately seems too ambitious. A movie about John Connor finding Kyle Reese seems perfect, but to add this entire plot, not even subplot because it's most of the movie, about Marcus Wright being a Terminator who brings them together is just too much and frankly not needed. Arnold also clearly didn't want to be in this movie, but it was cool to see him for the short second that we did. Should this movie have solely centered on John Connor and his search for Kyle Reese? Yes, it should. Do they still get their moments? Yes, they do. Am I disappointed watching this movie again as an adult? Yes, I am. Does it impact my rating? Nope, it doesn't. 8.5 out of 10, still love this movie. So when I was in this big Terminator phase growing up around the time that Terminator Salvation came out, I wanted to consume any and all media that was Terminator. The movies, the games, the arcade machines, you name it, I was all over it. Luckily for me, the Terminator franchise was alive and well during this time, and all of this Terminator mania ultimately spawned a TV show Terminator The Sarah Connor Chronicles. I remember really loving this show, it completely disregarded the events of Terminator 3 in favor of its own story, and it was really about Sarah protecting and teaching John about how to kill Terminators. The show wouldn't be complete without its own Terminator, or set of Terminators, so they delivered on that front with Cameron, a real subtle nod towards series creator James Cameron. This is a supremely underrated show. I'm not sure how it's aged. If this video does well enough, I'll make a separate video on two seasons of the show. But for a while, when I heard the name Sarah Connor, the first person that came to my mind was Lena Headey. She did fantastic in the role, and ultimately this was a show whose time was cut far too short. So I had never seen this one before, and I was actually really excited to watch a new Terminator movie. I knew it didn't have great reviews, but it was a new Terminator movie and I was really enjoying going through all these films again. I even liked the last one, maybe I'll like this one too. I didn't know anything about this plot or anything like that, only that it's kind of a weird, different future. This seems more in line with how the future looked in the trilogy of films, not so much salvation. The weaponry is futuristic, just like in the trilogy, and 10 minutes into the film, as I'm writing this script, I'm really digging this. John Connor is leading the resistance against Skynet, Kyle Reese is his right-hand man, the fight scenes are cool, the effects are good. Maybe this is the film about the future that Terminator fans wanted all along. The opening montage rehashes what we know but from the futuristic perspective and I really like it. This whole first act is setting up what happens in the beginning of the first Terminator, so it's kinda like a prequel but it's in the future, so it's not a prequel. 
I don't know, it's all really confusing. Seeing the actual time travel machine in this movie made me realize that we hadn't actually seen it before. It's actually really cool, but we very quickly see that this is not, in fact, the pre-sequel or anything of the sort, and this is just Terminator 1, but for a whole new generation. This is a different timeline, but the rehashing of events with a different outcome is really cool. There's this mystery around this new timeline, like who sent back the Terminator to protect Sarah when she was nine, this is entirely different, but it's intriguing. Even by the end of the movie, I was not really sold on Amelia Clark as Sarah Connor. I think Amelia is a great actress, but for Sarah Connor, I think she was more so just given the role because of her popularity than anything else. I think both her and Jai Courtney as Sarah and Kyle are a miscast. A lot of time is spent trying to develop their relationship through some expositional dialogue. It almost seems like they were filling in sequences so that way they could get to the next conversation between these two. So just like the first film, this whole film hinges on the fact that this relationship works, and I just don't really think it does. They don't really have great chemistry, they do alright in their roles, but I still just don't really buy them. The humor doesn't really land all that well. Sometimes it's fine, but most of the time it's not. This is kind of like a Marvel movie version of Terminator, and that's just not what Terminator is. There's very big comedic overtones in this film, and while there were comedic moments in the trilogy, they were far from outright comedies. This one leans too heavily into the comedy than any previous Terminator film did, and I think it's a disservice to the film. And some of the jokes last longer than they should have, almost as if they were pausing the scene for the audience in the theater to laugh, and this kind of editing is always so strange to me. If you're editing a film for an audience reaction, you might as well add in like a laugh track or something for the home release. Oh great, that's just great. I did not kill him. I feel like they wanted to do this film for a newer audience and try and modernize the story, so this whole multiverse mechanic was conceived, and in some ways it works, but in most cases it doesn't. It's about our over-reliance on technology and how something like Skynet could take advantage of that, which is completely plausible and a good message for the film, but sometimes it's either too heavy-handed or just not the priority. This is surely the most complex story out of any of the films, and I think it tries to do too much all at the same time. There are cool scenes like Sarah, Kyle, and John having a conversation about their histories with each other, but it's all negated because John isn't actually John. I absolutely detest how they made John Connor the villain and the embodiment of Skynet. It goes against everything that the previous Terminator films established. John is the future and the leader of the resistance. Turning him into the villain subverts your expectations, I guess? But it's not a very smart or respectful decision to make in terms of the franchise. I don't know, maybe that's an overreaction, but I think I hate this so much because I actually liked Jason Clark as John. John Connor. The beginning minutes of the movie is the Terminator movie that I want to see. I want to see a movie about John Connor leading the resistance against Skynet, and the way all of this looks, the design of everything, the vibrant colors, the effects, this all looks so amazing, so why does this movie need to complicate things with an overly complex plot? Arnold is back, and as he usually is, one of the greatest parts of the film. His role as the protective Terminator and father figure is ripped right from Terminator 2, but really heavily leaned upon, and I actually think that this is one of the better aspects of the film. Having him play father to Sarah and being old but not obsolete lends to a lot of the better humor in the film. A new addition that I really like is J.K. Simmons' character. For the story they're telling, he's another addition that really works with this story. He's also part of the humor that works, and I just generally like the trope of the crazy person that ends up being right at the end of the day. Overall, it's a pretty decent film. I might have sounded like I hate this movie, I don't. I feel like it bites off more than it can chew for sure, and it very clearly sets up a sequel that never came and never will come, mid credit scene and everything, but at least they try. It doesn't really explore anything new in terms of the story, they go back in time, stop Judgment Day, get attacked by a new and improved Terminator, it's all been done before, but it's a fine and fun movie. I'd give it like a solid 7 out of 10, just like most of the other Marvel movies. Also, Jason Clark and Amelia Clark play son and mother, though they have no real life relation. So that's pretty funny.
I had also never seen this film, but I never heard good things about it, like that John Connor is killed, but I didn't realize that it was literally 30 seconds into the movie. I also heard that this is kind of like the unofficial film to complete the trilogy because James Cameron was involved with this one as a producer, but whether it's this one or Rise of the Machines, it doesn't really make for a better trilogy. There are some really great aspects to this film. I think the idea of an augmented human is cool, and that's certainly mostly something that we've never seen before. The Terminator in this one actually is pretty unique, being able to split itself in two parts when needed. The Terminators of the future are also unique to everything we've seen before. So maybe unique Terminators are something synonymous with James Cameron, because all the Terminators in the movies without him are either slightly modified versions of what they've already done, or just flat out ones he's already done. Linda Hamilton being back as Sarah Connor is probably the best part of the movie. I think this is the reason why it's the unofficial third film, but having her back in this film is really cool. She gets her badass moments, and she also gets a full character arc, playing this really haunted character, learning to forgive and move on. She's still a badass, and it's a different character arc from Terminator 2, ever so slightly different, but still different. I think my favorite aspect of the movie is the future being different than Skynet because they actually did change that future in Terminator 2. Rise of the Machines gave an awful explanation as to how Skynet was still going to take over, and this one explains that Skynet never came to be, but something called Origin was replaced in its stead, because humanity was always going to be its own downfall. It's a nice change of pace and actually makes the story flow better. The story's use of modern technology is implemented very well to the story they tell. Genesis seemed like a story they wanted to have in modern day just for the sake of it, but this one actually makes sense. The technology is here to serve the story, not as a half-baked message about our over-reliance on it. As far as good things go, that's kind of it. Arnold isn't even that great this time around. He kind of seems shoehorned into the film. A Terminator who learned to have feelings after his mission was completed sounds cool on paper, and his dynamic with Sarah is really great, but it definitely seems like they just needed to find a way to incorporate Arnold into the story. It's not very different from his role in Genesis, though his humor is definitely toned down significantly. The new chosen one in this film is this girl, Danny. There's nothing particularly wrong with Danny, but there's nothing particularly interesting about her either. If you compare her to John Connor in Terminator 2, because they essentially fill the same role in both of their respective films, then Danny is far worse. John was this punk kid who used a device to get money from the ATM, and then later on to actually help the group, he learned about Terminators and tried to teach it how to be more human. He had some agency trying to stop his mom from killing the guy who creates Skynet, and Danny doesn't do anything like that in this film. She's kind of just along for the ride of it all. She creates some kind of agency by making the decision to stand and fight against the Terminator. She shows some compassion towards others, and that's really it. What I heard about this movie is its messages about our culture being very heavy-handed. There is certainly an air of modern symbolism, some people would call it being woke, but I didn't really find it too in your face for most of the film. It does make the plot a bit obvious. It was treated as some big twist that Danny was actually the new John Connor and the leader of the resistance, but it was very obvious from the beginning why Grace was protecting Danny. Some of it was in your face for sure, but I don't think it's as bad as everybody claimed it to be. I definitely don't like that they killed John in this film, but I ultimately think that they wanted a female-led movie, and having a story about trying to save the white male that saves everybody wasn't what they wanted. This film kind of just rehashes stuff from the first two films, doesn't really mark its own territory or make it stand out from anything other than having Linda Hamilton back as Sarah Connor. I found myself being really bored watching this movie. By the end of it, I was just ready for it to be over. Genesis might have been a Marvel movie version of a Terminator film, but it was still at least fun to watch. This one wasn't fun, and it wasn't interesting other than a few brief moments. I'd give it like a 6 out of 10. 
So just like any other film with time travel, things can get very complicated very quickly. In order to best understand this timeline, you need to understand what kind of time travel the Terminator franchise uses. Now, this conversation could go on for basically ever because the time travel mechanics are a complete mess in this franchise, so I'm going to try and explain things as simply as possible. I'm not a scientist, I'm a YouTuber, so keep that in mind. If you're wondering what movie I'm referring to on screen, just look up right here and it'll tell you. Time travel in the first three Terminator films operates under the condition that everything is a paradox or a loop. So, in 1997, an AI system called Skynet becomes self-aware and launches all the missiles and bombs around the world, killing 3 billion people. In the wake of Skynet's attack, cybernetic machines called Terminators are made to eradicate the remaining threat, aka the human race. But the humans resist this attack, and their leader, John Connor, is the top-level threat for all Terminators. So, since Skynet senses that this John Connor guy is a problem, they want to eradicate eradicate the threat a different way, sending a Terminator back in time to kill John's mother, Sarah Connor, so that way John can never be born. John intercepts this plan by sending his own soldier, Kyle Reese, back in time to protect his mother. So Sarah Connor and Kyle Reese battle this Terminator and also fall in love over the course of a day because Kyle Reese is actually John's father. So this, in and of itself, means that the timeline of events is always going to play out this way. Kyle will be born in the future, send him back in time to die, only for John to go on and become the leader of the resistance. But our characters in the future are under the impression that the past can be changed once and for all, to break the loop, if you will. So they send back another Terminator to protect John, and also to try and stop Skynet from ever being created. Our characters destroy all the evidence of the Terminators and Skynet, so that way it would seem that the loop is now closed. This is where I want to bring up the ripple effect theory. The ripple effect refers to when you throw a rock in still water, it creates ripples, but the water always rights itself. This timeline is a lot like that. They sent back Kyle Reese and these Terminators in order to prevent Judgment Day, which they did, causing a ripple effect in time. But the timeline always writes itself. So a different company gets a hold of the AI software for Skynet, or a different name like Origin, and the future continues to play out as it always had. AKA, the loop continues, regardless of if it's the same future, or a slightly different version of the future before. So basically, you can change things, but not really. But if we disregard the ripple effect theory for a moment and talk about actually breaking the loop, then we get Terminator Genesis. Now, this film introduces the concept of an origin point, meaning there is one specific moment in time that everything else around it, multiple timelines and whatnot, hinges upon. Think of the origin point as a ship's anchor. The anchor can stop the ship, otherwise it just keeps on going. The time loop is like the ship that keeps moving, and the anchor is the origin point. When John Connor is killed in the future, it fractures the timeline, leading to Sarah Connor already being a capable warrior and a Terminator being there to protect her, because everything else that was set up previously is now completely different, because John's death in the future is an origin point for new timelines to happen. Still confused? I'd be surprised if you weren't. Disregard all this time travel for a moment and think of it like this. The first three Terminator films act as their own trilogy, with Terminator Salvation taking place after Judgment Day finally happens in Terminator 3. Then the day finally comes for Kyle Reese to be sent back in time, so he does that in Terminator Genesis, and then other stuff happens, but I'm not trying to be confusing, so this is it. Terminator 1 to 5, and everything loops back on each other. Now, if you take away Terminator 3, 4, and 5, then Dark Fate is the new end to the trilogy. And now these movies act as a kinda complete story. Like I said, the Terminator franchise has had many ups and many downs over the years. But over the past decade or so, Terminator has become a shell of its former self. With needlessly complex stories and rehashing plotlines of previous, more successful films, the future of this franchise is really pretty dark. 
Darker Than Dark Fate, and that's saying something. The most recent entries were both failed attempts at reboots. No matter the star power they had, or the version of Arnold's Terminator, they were both critically panned and maybe not total financial disasters, but they weren't that great either. Both of these films were meant to be the first of a new trilogy, and neither of them got sequels. Even with James Cameron back as a producer and Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor, Dark Fate was a failed attempt at a first movie in a new trilogy. And this really was their Hail Mary attempt at saving the Terminator franchise, and it failed. Even Salvation wasn't a huge hit, and this was also supposed to be the start of a new trilogy. I truly don't know what's next for the Terminator franchise, because truth be told, I think this might be it. No matter the tone of the film, the stars you attach, the action sequences you perform, it really seems like no one's interested in this franchise anymore. It had its glory days in the past, but there's been more mediocre films than there were great ones, even with my personal biases is added. It seems that this franchise has exhausted all of its efforts with reboots and timeline swaps, and there hasn't been one that has quite stuck the landing with the majority of moviegoers since 1991. And with Arnold retiring from the role of the Terminator, the glory days really do seem like they're in the past, and they'll probably never return. So what do I think? Do I want another Terminator movie? I guess so, but it depends on what it's about, who's making it, and really the team behind it all. If they were to continue this franchise, I really think the way to do it would be with another TV show. The Sarah Connor Chronicles were supremely underrated and added a lot of lore to the universe, most of it being pretty great. In a perfect world, we'd just get Sarah Connor Chronicles Season 3, or even just a reboot slash continuation of that show in general. Really, the only thing that I want out of this franchise is the first 10 minutes of Terminator Genesis, but a full movie of that. I really don't understand the needless complexities of adding in characters in a movie about John Connor, or creating a multiverse where John Connor is the bad guy. Just give me a movie about John Connor leading the Resistance, his time leading up to sending Kyle Reese back in time, and what he does after that, because all of that story is basically uncharted territory. I really think that they should take inspiration from another time travel story, and that's X-Men Days of Future Past. This film balanced the past and future stories very well, and ended with a breaking of a time loop. A movie like this, but about Terminator that ends up changing the story and stopping the future once and for all, would be a great way to finally let this franchise close its red eye. They went overboard with this franchise. They really did. They've thrown three different Hail Marys, and now the game's over. They lost. This franchise as a whole is lost, quite possibly forever, and it's really up to you to decide if that's for better or worse. But if they do happen to make another movie or a TV show, what will it even be about? When will it take place? And the real question everybody's asking, which actress from Game of Thrones will play Sarah Connor next? Special thanks to my channel members, you guys are the absolute best, and you guys are the first to see this video. So if you want to see videos early like them, become a channel member. You get lots of exclusive perks depending on the tier, so check it out by hitting that join button. Special thanks to these guys right here, and I'll see you all in the next one. Yeah.